Hi, my name is Mike Mueller-Smith, and I'm the co-founder and director of the Criminal Justice Administrative Record System, or CJARS for short. We're so excited and humbled to see such broad enthusiasm for this and introduction to CJARS webinar. We've had over a thousand people register for this event from over 30 countries around the world from a range of academic, nonprofit, and governmental backgrounds. In today's webinar, we'll be discussing a range of topics, including what is CJARS? And where can you find more detailed documentation about the project? What are the similarities and differences between CJARS and other existing statistical reporting initiatives on the US criminal justice system? How can you access CJARS and what are the research opportunities it will enable you to pursue? And what are the resources that we have available in our project to support early stage researchers? In order to address these topics, I'll introduce you to several key resources that our team has developed. These include the CJARS data documentation, a benchmarking report that reproduces existing federal aggregate statistical series from the Bureau of Justice Statistics using CJARS microdata, a proposal guide for those who are interested in applying to work with the CJARS microdata, and a fellowship solicitation that offers support for early stage researchers in incorporating CJARS into their ongoing research efforts. At the end of this presentation, we'll have a live Q&A panel featuring staff from both CJARS and the U.S. Census Bureau. We received a number of really great questions from individuals registering for this event, but please submit any additional questions you might have using the Q&A tab in your Zoom meeting window. At the end of this series, we'll post the answers to the FAQ on our website in the coming weeks. To begin, let's start with talking about defining the Criminal Justice Administrative Record System. What is CJARS? CJARS has been founded in 2016, and it's a joint infrastructure project between the University of Michigan and the U.S. Census Bureau. We are building a novel data platform to modernize research and statistical reporting on the U.S. criminal justice system, which includes event-level criminal justice data with nationwide scope, tracking events across key milestones in the justice system, with capacity to link uh, with individual-level survey and administrative data on socioeconomic outcomes and backgrounds from the U.S. Census Bureau. It's been made possible with financial support from the National Science Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Lauren John Arnold Foundation, University of Michigan, and the U.S. Census Bureau. This figure maps out the high-level operations of the CJARS project, as well as the four major stakeholder groups involved in our success. On the left-hand side, you can see the data providers. These include federal, state, and local agencies, which are law enforcement departments, criminal court systems, correctional departments, as well as state repositories. The University of Michigan collects these records from data providers using a variety of means, including web scraping, FOIA, data use agreements, research agreements, as well as donations from researchers holding public records. The data is then integrated and harmonized into a single national schematic and transferred to the U.S. Census Bureau. At the U.S. Census Bureau, these records are processed through the Person Identification Validation Servers to both de-identify and anonymize the records, but also prepare them for individual level linkage to other sources of socioeconomic behavior. These anonymized records are then transferred to the anonymized research servers where external researchers, like many of you, to create non-CJARS external publications. In addition, the CJARS team can use this integrated research environment to produce CJARS-based statistical reports to provide back to data providers to help them gain more insight into the caseload composition and outcomes that their criminal justice caseloads are facing. CJARS data is oriented around the concept of the justice-involved individual. This does not presuppose guilt or innocence. It's purely defined by having contact with the U.S. criminal justice system. The JII population includes arrestees, criminal defendants, inmates, and probationers or parolees, essentially individuals who are in community supervision. Why do we need CJARS? We believe we're making several key contributions over existing resources, and these include 
longitudinal, multi-jurisdictional data that's collected, harmonized, and linked to track individuals across space and time, a system that can trace the evolution of a criminal episode as it moves through the different stages of the justice system, a data platform that was built from the beginning for integration with socioeconomic survey and administrative data held by the U.S. Census Bureau at the individual level, and a project that prioritizes secure, responsible research access options without gatekeeping to balance both the privacy and confidentiality of the records, but also ensure that there's an equal playing field and clear rules on how researchers can access these records. It's helpful to think about what CJARS is not in order to help define the scope of this project. Below are several examples of groups and events that are out of scope. These include minors who are involved in the juvenile justice system, reported crimes that do not result in an arrest, the career progression of law enforcement personnel, prosecutors, judges, or correctional officers, or other events that might elevate criminal risk or be impacted by involvement with the criminal justice system, such as housing evictions, child welfare investigations, or child support obligations. But as the data ecosystem of the FSRDC environment continues to mature, other projects may be able to support these research agendas in the future. In this next section, we'll talk about the documentation for the CJARS project. The CJARS data documentation is quite extensive. Our national level data documentation file is over 200 pages, and the state specific files include over 1,000 pages of documentation. The contents of these documents include a project description and data collection methods, the data holdings and the structure of the data, the linkage process that we use in the data and other automated algorithms that we use for harmonization purposes, and a variable codebook and descriptive statistics. You can find these documents on our website, cjars.isr.umich.edu. Our data holdings are quite extensive given how recent our organization was founded. These include over 2 billion lines of raw data, over 150 million unique criminal justice events from over 30 million unique individuals, and statewide coverage in one or more criminal justice domains for 43% of the U.S. population. CJARS is composed of one person-level roster and five event-specific data tables with two ways to internally link the data. First, you can use the CJARS ID, which uniquely identifies individuals, to pool all events associated with a single person across all jurisdictions and over time. Or you can use the event identifiers, like the arrest identifier or the adjudication ID, to follow an individual criminal episode as it progresses through the stages of the justice system. Historical coverage varies across geography and procedural domain. Below you can see a figure from our data documentation for a subset of CJARS covered states. Let's take the example of Pennsylvania. In this case, our court records only extend back to 2008 currently, but our prison records include entries extending all the way back to 1987. We aren't always in the position of collecting statewide records. In Texas, you can see there are certain years and procedural domains where we have to rely on county or other local sources of records that don't together constitute the complete state of Texas. These are highlighted in yellow. In addition, we're highlighting instances where we have snapshots of the current caseload in red circles, and places where we're working currently to expand our data coverage in green bars. Our national data schema balances between complexity to support nuanced research questions and consistency across jurisdictions to reduce barriers to working with the data. Unfortunately, our project has finite resources, which limits the level of detail that can be extracted from our source files. We have to face trade-offs between data collection, data processing, and data analysis. But where possible, we seek to preserve source values such as exact offense descriptions and sentencing fields, in addition to providing users with harmonized values for these variables to support a flexible range of uses. In the course of processing these records, we've developed several innovations in the space of data science. 
And these include a person level probabilistic record linkage model where we're using cutting edge machine learning techniques trained on fingerprint verified identifiers at the University of Michigan to be able to identify across space and time which criminal records are associated with the same person. You can see our working paper, Mueller, Smith and Gross 2020, Modernizing Person Level Entity Resolution with Biometrically Linked Records if you want to learn more details about this process. It's important to note that no biometric data is passed from the University of Michigan to the U.S. Census Bureau as we understand and respect the privacy of these underlying variables. In addition, we have developed the text-based offense classification tool, or the TOC tool, which we use to translate over 4 million unique offense description strings to a standardized set of 271 offense codes. This is uniquely possible through a collaboration with Measures for Justice, who has spent several years hand coding over 500,000 unique offense descriptions, which we use to train a hierarchical machine learning model to define both the type of offense overall, violent, drug, property, as well as the specific nature of the offense, such as attempted murder or possession of narcotics. We plan to launch a public web-based interface later this year for researchers such as yourselves who might be interested in using the TOC tool to classify text-based offense description fields into a standardized set of offense codes. Our data documentation provides a description, summary statistics, and data visualization for every harmonized variable in the CJARS data platform. Our team has worked tirelessly to provide extensive data documentation for the CJARS project. We encourage you to visit our website to check out the materials and resources posted there. In this third section, we'll talk about our efforts to validate CJARS against official federal statistical series on the US criminal justice system. We refer to this broad area of work as benchmarking. We believe there are many comparative strengths of the CJARS project, but with these come potential vulnerabilities. We utilize an enterprising approach to data collection, including web scraping, FOIA, data use agreements, research agreements, and donations. But as a result, we have inconsistent data structures and value codes. Our probabilistic matching algorithms in the absence of unique identifiers may over or underestimate the number of individuals having contact with the justice system. And our machine learning augmented harmonization strategies help us overcome the challenges of free entry text fields, but may misclassify offenses systematically. As a, as a consequence, there is a fundamental need to validate the CJARS data product against existing statistical series. We have produced a benchmarking report to assess the reproducibility of official BJS published aggregate statistical series using CJARS microdata, including the Uniform Crime Reports, the State Court Processing Statistics Program, the National Prison Statistics Program, the National Corrections Reporting Program, and the Annual Probation and Annual Parole Surveys. This report can be found on our website. Example exercises included in this report include caseload composition comparisons, event counts over time, and caseload populations over time. Where possible, we report state or substate results to align with our level of data acquisition and processing. On the right-hand side of this slide, you can see one example from this report, where we're comparing the characteristics of felony cases in large US cities as measured by the CJARS database compared to the state court processing series, or SCIPS. We want to see alignment between these two data sources where values should show up along the 45 degree line. The comparisons include demographic traits like age, gender, race, and ethnicity, court processing statistics like the duration of trial, as well as court outcomes like the disposition, incarceration length, and probation length. While not every comparison is spot on, the vast majority of the observations are clustering around the 45 degree line which indicates that CJARS is successfully reproducing multiple waves of the state court processing series using the adjudication microdata.
In this second example, we're looking at prison entries in Pennsylvania, where we're comparing the number of entries produced off of the CJAR's microdata to the NPS and NCRP aggregate statistics. You can see that overall, the CJARS data lines up quite closely with the NPS and NCRP entries. Before our dataset coverage starts, we can observe an increasing number of entries starting in the 1980s, where this represents individuals who are in prison as of the start of our coverage in 1987. On the right hand side, you can see that the CJARS data extends further in time than either the NPS or NCRP aggregate statistics. This reflects the agility with which we collect data. The drop that you're seeing in 2020 is not a dramatic change in policy in Pennsylvania, but instead the fact that we've been able to acquire, process, and make available for research purposes mid-year counts of prison entries. The CJAR's benchmarking report will be a living document and we plan to update it on an annual basis to account for growth in the scope, both geographically and procedurally, of the CJARS project, as well as as we refine our algorithms to improve our harmonization of the records. Please check our website for the most up-to-date version of this document. In this next section, we'll talk about how CJARS can be accessed through the Federal Statistical Research Data Center Network, or the FSRDC system for short. The CJARS microdata is currently available for external request to qualified researchers on approved projects through the FSRDC network. There are no CJARS project charges. We are making this data available to researchers at no cost, but FSRDC sites may have data access fees. We are also working to build a public synthetic data product that reproduces the underlying variation in CJARS without compromising the individual privacy and confidentiality of the justice-involved population. We're hoping to release this in late 2022. Finally, we are working to build a public data portal for aggregate statistical information about caseloads and their socioeconomic outcomes. The launch date for this is still to be determined. FSRDC research is authorized under United States Code Title 13. Meeting Title 13 requirements can be an opaque process for those without prior experience working in the FSRDC system. Our team has produced a CJARS Title 13 proposal guide that will help facilitate your successful CJARS-based research proposals. It covers requesting CJARS data access through the Census Bureau's FSRDC system, proposal development and requirements, guidance on how to meet Title 13 statutory requirements, where to find information on other linkable datasets held in the FSRDC system, bringing your own data into the FSRDC system, and review timelines and what to expect after proposal submission. You can find this report on our website. In order to work with the CJARS microdata, one has to submit a proposal to the FSRDC system. This proposal needs to include a project overview, and a description of the research methods, a list of the requested data and the leakage procedures that you plan to implement, an explanation of the statistical output that will be generated, and a statement of benefits of the project for the US Census Bureau. Additional review by CJARS data providers may occur depending on what jurisdictions are being studied and what level of geographic aggregation are intended for your research findings. If you have questions or concerns about either of these review processes, please contact our staff at cjars-data-users at umich.edu. Once approved, research occurs in the FSRDC network. These are secure Census Bureau facilities housed in partner institutions across the United States where researchers can access de-identified anonymized microdata. There are 30 locations currently around the United States, with new sites being developed each year. Access costs vary by location, affiliation, and project duration. Researchers can bring their own data in for linkage, but this may incur additional costs. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the FSRDC system has expanded secure virtual access so that researchers can continue their important work 
while still remaining in compliance with local public health guidelines. Only aggregate statistical material reviewed by U.S. Census Disclosure Review Boards can be released from the FSRDC system. There is no individual level microdata that can be removed from the FSRDC sites. Researchers can link truly amazing data through the FSRDC system. These include anonymized data that can be linked at the person, address, and employer levels, including survey data like the decennial censuses, the American Community Survey, the current population survey, and the survey of income and program participation, as well as administrative records like the longitudinal employer household dynamics quarterly earnings data, the federal program data including Medicaid and Medicare enrollment, social security programs, and HUD assistance, and state program data like SNAP, TANF, and WIC. In order to illustrate the value of these linkage opportunities, I'd like to walk you through some of the original research that we've been doing here at the CJARS team. Before getting into specific results, I need to state any views expressed herein are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the views of the Census Bureau. All of results were approved for release by the Disclosure Review Board of the U.S. Census Bureau, with authorization numbers as seen on the slide. In this, in this figure, we're showing the percent of children who, since birth, have ever experienced parental justice involvement as measured by either a felony conviction or a parent entering prison. To produce this figure, we identified children born in CJARS covered states in recent decades, linked them to their parents using census household survey data, tax filing dependency information, and household rosters from public benefit files, and identified what share of the parents were showing up in the CJARS criminal history data and the timing of those events relative to their child's age. From this, we're learning original insight into the scope of the U.S. justice system, for the first time learning that more than 10% of children born in the United States have a parent receive a felony conviction by the time that they reach age 18. In this second example, we've calculated the probability of receiving one or more felony convictions by the time that somebody turns age 25, conditional on their race and ethnicity, sex, place of birth, and year of birth. To produce this figure, we used the Social Security Administration's Numidant file to identify the timing and place of birth, as well as demographic traits for individuals linked these cohorts to the CJARS repository and calculated what share had received one or more felony convictions by the time that they reached age 25. From this we're learning not just about the disparate contact rates with the justice system by racial and ethnic background, but also about the variance that individuals experience based off of when and where they were born in the United States. In this last example, we're calculating the annual probability of employment between 2006 and 2018 for cohorts released from CJARS covered prisons between the years 2006 and 2010. In addition, there is a reference cohort of adult individuals with terminal educational attainment of less than a high school to degree to provide a benchmark to compare the employment outcomes for the justice involved population. To construct this figure, we identify all individuals leaving CJARS covered prisons between the years 2006 and 2010, link them to their annual W-2 filings to identify whether they were employed at one or more jobs in each calendar year, and follow their outcomes over time. To create the reference cohort, we identify adults in the American Community Survey who have less than a high school degree and link them to their W-2 filings to measure their employment rates on an annual basis. There are several important features that we learn from this figure. First, the employment outcomes for the justice-involved population are well below that of the reference cohort, even though they have less than a high school degree and marginal labor market attachment. Second, the drop in employment over the course of the Great Recession was substantially larger for the justice-involved population than the reference cohort, 
with declines in employment rates around 20 percentage points for the 2006 prison release cohort. And finally, in spite of when an individual was released from prison and how that intersected with the timing of the Great Recession, it appears that all cohorts roughly converge to the same final equilibrium outcome of employment rates around 45%. Here are a few examples of research projects that you could pursue using CJARS. You could look at labor market outcomes after criminal justice intervention through linking CJARS individuals to the longitudinal employer household dynamics data to measure quarterly employment earnings and in industry after the intervention. You could examine neighborhood environment and criminal justice involvement through linking CJARS individuals to addresses using decennial census data and measuring outcomes in the American Community Survey. Finally, you could think of criminal justice contact as an outcome for a non-criminal justice intervention through either bringing your own person-level program participation or randomized control data to the FSRDC environment, linking that to CJARS, and measuring criminal justice involvement after the intervention. We are continually working to expand CJARS to nationwide coverage. Our success will depend on partnerships with criminal justice agencies, donations of public, legally redistributable data from researchers like many of you, and suggestions of data resources we may have overlooked that you do not see covered in our data documentation. If you have ideas or suggestions on data that could be integrated into CJARS, please contact us at cjars-staff at umich.edu to start the conversation. The linkage opportunities afforded by the FSRDC system represent the culmination of years of work for our team and a transformational moment in studying the U.S. criminal justice system. It's important to have a diverse range of voices and perspectives at the table as this research agenda moves forward. We strongly encourage everyone to seriously consider applying to work with the CJARS microdata. In this final section, we'll talk about NSF-funded fellowships that will jumpstart data access. With support from the National Science Foundation, the CJARS team is launching a fellowship competition whose benefits will include a $10,000 stipend to be used in support of your research, either to defray data access costs, to support your time as a researcher to write an FSRDC proposal, or to help you hire research staff. Although we can't guarantee approval, we will provide mentorship on the FSRDC proposal process uh, from the CJARS team. And finally, you'll have an opportunity to present your research findings or research plan at the annual CJARS Board of Directors meeting. The deadline to apply for this fellowship is May 28, 2021, and decisions will be announced in mid-June. To apply, you can find information about the solicitation and the submission portal on our project website. The application requirements include a research proposal describing the topic of study, the intended data to be linked, and the research methods you plan to utilize, a current CV or resume, and a data access plan describing which FSRDC location you plan to conduct your research in, any anticipated data access barriers, and your plans to address those barriers which may include using the stipend to pay for data access fees. You may want to consider contacting your local FSRDC administrator to learn more about your data access options prior to submission. Submitted proposals will be evaluated according to four criteria. First, the intellectual merit of the research proposal, the compatibility of the CJARS data holdings with the proposed research, Third, the feasibility of the data access plan. And finally, the experience and training of the principal investigator. Priority groups will include early stage researchers, demographic groups underrepresented in science and engineering, and research fields underrepresented in the FSRDC system. This year we anticipate awarding three to five CJARS NSF fellowships and we're working currently with our foundation partners to make this an annual competition in years to come. This concludes the presentation portion of this webinar. For more information of the material described, please check out our website, cjars.isr.umich.edu, or contact the CJARS team 
with your questions regarding data collection and integration efforts, research projects, and the fellowship program. Thank you for your time.